Okay, so there's our Zoom lady. I'm gonna pause it. And there it is. Um, all right, is that working, Maggie? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Aaron Wills, and I'm uh, from Little Hillberry Farm, which is in Minnesota. Uh, I was telling Maggie I'm a little bit nervous because I haven't given a presentation in a while. So um, bear with me here. I uh, Hopefully I can keep it together. Uh, so here's just a quick outline of what I'm gonna go over tonight. Uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about our farm and my background, just to give you some context. Uh, kind of compare and contrast day neutrals versus June bring strawberries a little bit. Um, you know, many of you probably kind of already know the difference, but just in case you don't, just so that we're all kind of on the same page. And then I'll, we've been growing day neutrals on our farm for the past four years. So I'll kind of talk through the evolution of the systems that we've used and how we kind of arrived at caterpillar tunnels. And then finally, just kind of going through the kind of nitty gritty of growing day neutral strawberries just throughout the year from kind of planting to taking care of the plants to harvest and just kind of what we do. Um, so to get started, just a little bit about our farm. Uh, we are located about 45 minutes to an hour south of the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul metro area. We're probably about an hour and a half north of the Iowa border on Interstate 35. So we're in zone 4B. Uh, we've been around about 10 years. Uh, my wife and I started the farm in 2011 when we planted an acre and a half of blueberries. Um, we now currently have four and a half acres of blueberries, uh, about 4,500 plants. Uh, we have five caterpillar tunnels and a high tunnel uh, with the neutral strawberries. We also grow raspberries. Um, we're curling, currently trialing raspberries in a high tunnel and kind of comparing that to growing them out in the field, kind of like how they're normally done. We do a plant sale in the spring um, where we partner with some local vegetable farms to offer flowers, vegetables, native plants for like people's gardens, and then we sell berry plants. Uh, and then finally we do, a, we have, you pick pumpkins in the fall, we have about a half an acre of pumpkins. So we try to kind of have something happening sort of through May through the fall where we're, we have something to offer and sell to our customers. Uh, and everything we do is uh, certified organic. Um, just in terms of how we sell what we grow, um, we sell almost everything at the farm, either pick your own or pre-picked by us. We have a couple wholesale customers, you know, people who are making jam or um, some distillers, for instance, in town. Um, but we're really focused on people coming to our farm and selling directly to our customers. Uh, 2021, our revenue was $175,000 and our goal in 2022 is 225,000. And I just mentioned that because I think it's sometimes it's just helpful to kind of understand the scale of a farm and just kind of help to have a mental picture of just like how big or small we are. Um, and finally, the strawberries are our second largest crop behind blueberries. And um, in 2022, we're hoping to sell like $50,000 worth of strawberries. So we do grow a, you know, a fair amount in these tunnels. Um, and we're, we've been expanding it each year. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I didn't grow up on a farm, although both my parents did. And I do have quite a few relatives that still farm. Uh, you know, I went to the college and the Peace Corps, and I think like a fair amount of people of my generation kind of got interested in food and where it comes from and organic food and were, you know, motivated by care for the environment and, and sort of getting into farming. And I never really planned to be a farmer, but after I came back to the Peace Corps and started working in Northfield, I met some young vegetable farmers who were starting CSAs and it was just really inspiring and, and kind of got me interested in starting a farm and my wife and I had been going to you pick berry farms. So picking strawberries and blueberries at other people's farms and just loved it and uh, decided that's what we uh, wanted to do as well. Um, so, you know, our kind of goal is to provide, you know, delicious organic fruit to our community and, 
and a place where people can come to experience where their food comes from. My wife is an elementary teacher uh, and I worked full-time off the farm until 2018. Uh, and now I mainly manage the farm. You know, she's got her own career. Uh, she's involved certainly in the summers, but you know, the farm is kind of my main, um, my main job. Uh, and you know, up till 2018, all we had is blueberries. And then when I quit my off-farm job, we started to diversify and add crops. You know, pumpkins, strawberries, raspberries. And in 2018 is the first year that we started experimenting with date-neutral strawberries. Uh, any questions so far? Well, um, I was just curious, do you have any like seasonal uh, help that you have come through or is it just primarily yourself and then your wife helping out? Uh, yeah, sure. So yeah, we do, we do have quite a bit of seasonal help actually. I have uh, two employees who work almost full time starting in April through October. Uh, who have been with me for a while. And then we hire usually some high school and college kids to help with picking berries in July, August, into September a little bit. And then since we do pick your own as well, I mean, mainly in blueberries, uh, we have usually, I don't know, probably six to 10 people who help with that. Uh, you know, when we're open for you pick blueberries, we usually have like six people working. It's kind of a busy scene. Um, you know, we'll commonly, you know, have a couple hundred people come in for pick your own blueberries. Um, cool. All right. Well, I'll um, kind of turn the focus here to strawberries. Uh, I, I think that Although we started growing blueberries and that was kind of my first love in terms of fruit, uh, I feel like strawberries have surpassed them in the past couple of years. They're, they're just so photogenic and they're just kind of bring such delight to people like farm fresh strawberries, whether or not they're day neutral or traditional June bearing strawberries are just, they just, people love them and they get so much joy from them. Uh, so just to kind of talk about June bearing real briefly, uh, this is, you know, what is grown widely in Minnesota and probably wherever you are, if you're in the Midwest. Uh, the way they're usually, you know, grown is in year one, the plants are planted. Uh, they produce runners and kind of fill in the row, like you see here in this picture. And then, you know, in the late summer, uh, early fall, they set fruit buds and they're covered with straw to protect them over the winter. And then the straw is pulled back in the spring and they flower in May and produce a big crop of berries in middle of June to early July. And that cycle kind of repeats for a couple of years. Usually a field is kept for two, three, maybe four growing seasons. And, you know, so strawberry season, you know, in Minnesota, when you say strawberry season, you mean, you know, middle of July, middle of June, excuse me, through, early July, um, you know, you get one big flush of flowers in May and three to four weeks later, you get a big flush of fruit. And it's kind of a very fast and furious season. You know, if it gets really hot in June, sometimes strawberry season will only be a couple of weeks or if it rains a lot. So there's just this abundance of berries all at one time. Uh, you know, usually people are open for pick your own like every day of the week because there's just so many strawberries that come so fast. Um, and so, you know, kind of comparing that to the neutral strawberries, you know, they have a different flowering cycle. I believe the day neutral refers to the fact that the plant will, no matter how much daylight there is, the plant will continue to flower. And I think June bearing strawberries uh, will only flower in this a certain amount of daylight. So that's why they flower in the spring. So I have this picture here just to show you, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see there's a red strawberry in the bottom left and there's some other unripe strawberries right next to them. And then the plants at the same time have flowers and those flowers will become fruit in probably about three weeks. So the plant in the day neutral is both producing fruit at one moment and, you know, and has flowers for fruit that will be there 
uh, in three weeks. And so most of our plants seem to go through about four to five flowering cycles throughout the growing season. So they're kind of constantly producing fruit um, from June is when they flower. So they start producing fruit in July, all the way into October. So you don't get the huge flush of berries at one time over a couple of weeks. You get this kind of slow trickle. And that's just like kind of a different, I think that I don't really know how the yields compare exactly, uh, but it's just a more even slow kind of yield throughout three to four months. Uh, another big difference though between day neutrals versus June bearing in Minnesota is they're not winter hardy. So we don't overwinter these plants. We plant them in April as an annual. You know, we harvest what we can of the fruit until October and then we pull the plants out. Uh, and so, you know, that cycle repeats every year we have to replant. And there's definitely, you know, more investment in in plants because we're you know constantly replanting versus planting once and then you know, kind of using those same plants for four years. Uh, so you know why why was I interested in growing them? Well, I mean to be honest, we got approached by the University of Minnesota to trial them. Uh, they were doing some research on if they'd be a viable crop in Minnesota, and I'd never heard of them before. But what I was interested in is. You know, having strawberries for a different season, you know, this three week season in July, June, early July is here and gone and to be able to offer our customers uh, strawberries for three months instead of three weeks is really appealing. Uh, and what we found is that if you can grow them, they sell themselves. You take them to the farmer's market, sell them at your farm, if you were selling to a co-op or wherever. I mean, people will buy them as fast as you can produce them. Uh, the demand is just really big. Uh, and, you know, since you have strawberries at a different season, you know, just like vegetables, if you have tomatoes really early, you can charge, you know, a higher price. Uh, and, you know, you can charge more for them, and especially in like September and October. Um, and finally, you know, I might be a little bit biased, but, the flavor is outstanding. And I, I kind of think it's better than a lot of the June bearing varieties. They're um, a little bit firmer, uh, but we, you know, either way you slice it, um, the flavor is really good. People will, you know, they'll be really excited when they get to try one. Uh, and so this picture, you know, was taken this year on October 7th. You know, we were harvesting beautiful, ripe strawberries uh, in early October. Uh, and, you know, that's just, that's a really fun thing to be able to offer your customers. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to kind of spend a little bit of time just talking about kind of where we started and how we got to where we are in terms of using Caterpillar tunnels. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's, it's helpful for you maybe to see that there are other options and maybe, you know, maybe one of these options is something that you'd like to do. It might fit your farm better than, than what we're doing. Uh, so the University of Minnesota uh, is kind of who introduced us to the system, like I said, and they had a way that they wanted to do it. And so that's how we started in year one. And that included making raised beds and then laying white uh, plastic mulch over the raised beds. And so this you know, shows you that equipment. That's not equipment that we had. So they, they brought out their own equipment and kind of did it for us. Um, and you know, this is what it looked like here on the, on the picture on the left. And on the far left, you'll see there's two rows and those have this, this kind of what, what I call low tunnels. And you can see that in the picture on the upper right is what it ended up looking like. So these are low tunnels, these kind of wire hoops and then these small, a uh, roll of plastic that's strung over the hoops. And so it's like kind of a mini caterpillar tunnel or mini high tunnel, just covering one bed. And they wanted to compare that system with just growing them out in the open field. Um, so we had both right next to each other and you know, our job was just to provide them with feedback. And you know what we found in that first year is that low tunnels definitely had a higher yield than just in the regular field, you know, with no protection, uh, shouldn't come with any surprise, but, uh, 
But what we also found is that, you know, I'll just be honest, I really didn't like low tunnels. Um, they just had a lot of problems and took a lot of labor. So, you know, we get big windy thunderstorms in the summer and water would pool on top of the plastic because it wouldn't be super tight and we'd have to go and kind of push it off. Uh, wind would blow the, the plastic off to one side. And so then we'd have to come back and like resituate it. Um, you know, you have to do all this lowering and raising the sides by hands. So you have to walk through the row. And although we got the low tunnels for free, you know, I was thinking about if we could ever scale this system up, could we, you know, instead of planting two rows of this, could we plant, you know, 20? And, you know, for one bed, it was going to cost like $800. And it just kind of didn't really pencil out to me. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the yield there on the bottom, you know, we were getting about third of a pound of plant, third of a pound of strawberries per plant. U of M got a lot more, uh, three quarters of a pound of strawberries per plant. And honestly, I think their yield is more realistic just because we didn't really know what we were doing. And, you know, we made a lot of mistakes that first year. Um, but so, you know, I kind of concluded after that first year that the low tunnel system wasn't really for me. And so in the second year, we decided to try just basically the raised beds with white plastic malls just out in a field, kind of like normal, if you will. Um, and we had a lot of them and we planted like a half an acre and um, I sort of look back and kind of shudder now because it turned out to be a lot of work and a fair amount of things didn't go well, but uh, it was a good experiment. So we tried basically taking away the low tunnels and it was really quick to set up the raised beds and the plastic mulch. It's all mechanized and it goes pretty fast. Uh, and so we were able to get a lot of plants in the ground. Um, but uh, so, you know, on the positive side, it was definitely less labor intensive because we didn't have the, the low tunnels to mess around with. And, and it could be scaled up and we could plant a lot of plants um, in a big field pretty quickly, at least setting up the beds. Uh, but we discovered, I think the first year, it wasn't a really wet year. And the second year, it was. And what we discovered is that the day neutral varieties that we were growing developed a lot of leaf disease. Um, and there's kind of a picture of that in the upper left there. And, and as an organic grower, we just didn't really have any solution for that problem. I, I don't know if conventional growers do, but I imagine they probably do, but we just didn't have any, you know, anything that we could spray that was gonna stop that. And so the plants, um, you know, just weren't as healthy and weren't as productive. Um, and the other thing we found is that um, when it rains a lot and the, the berries sit on the white plastic and, they're, and when it rains, it, a little film of water gets between the berry and the white plastic and it just sits there and it gets soft. And so in the upper right corner there, there's a picture of just like a soft spot on a berry. Um, and you just really can't sell that. You know, it doesn't, doesn't stay good for very long. And in a, you know, in a, in the straw system with June bearing strawberries, you know, the water just percolates through that straw and percolates into the ground. Well, we had this impermeable, impermeable barrier with the white plastic. And so the water just wasn't able to kind of make its way through. And so the berries would have these soft spots. And because of those soft spots, we tried to harvest before it was going to rain. Uh, to try to save as many, you know, berries as possible. And that became kind of a nightmare because, you know, it was just super disruptive. We were always just like watching the radar, you know, like, is it going to rain this afternoon? Is it not going to rain? And it was just, it was just a stressful situation. Um, we did do some pick your own with this system and then people really loved it. Um, but you know, if you look on the bottom there, our yield, like saleable yield of like first quality just like went down and um, kind of realized that like, it wasn't gonna work either. Uh, so, you know, that's, I guess the great thing about farming is that these challenges kind of lead you to keep thinking about new ways to solve these kind of problems. And so we moved on, you know, the next year uh, to try and caterpillar tunnels. And I guess I'm, I'm, I'll maybe just take a moment to talk about caterpillar tunnels in, in case some of you aren't familiar with them. 
And Aaron, can uh, I ask a clarifying question real quick too? Yeah. So can you clarify how strawberries are pollinated and what that might mean for, um, you know, if you have them enclosed in one of these low tunnels or caterpillar tunnel versus open air? And then answer that first and I've got one other one for you. Sure, so yeah, strawberries are pollinated by bees. You know, we, uh, we have a beekeeper who keeps honeybees on our farm and then we also have a fair amount of native, uh, native bees. Uh, and so, yeah, if you create an entirely closed area, you know, like, you, you know, they wouldn't get pollinated because the bees wouldn't get in. But, you know, the nice thing about, I mean, let's just go back here for a moment to low tunnels. I mean, a lot of times the sides are up. So the bees have really no problem getting in there. You know, in the heat of the summer, you keep the sides up to keep them as cool as possible. So you're really just trying to keep the rain from falling down on top of them in low tunnels a lot of times. Uh, and so the bees don't have any problem pollinating and, and in, you know, caterpillar tunnels uh, that, you know, we keep the ends off of ours, um, but we also keep the sides up too throughout the summer. So you really don't have any, any issues with pollination. Um, if you did like close up a caterpillar tunnel or a high tunnel tight and have the sides down, the ends closed off, uh, then you could definitely um, have a problem with pollination. Um, you know, something I'll talk about later with growing day neutrals, though, is you, you would never want to do that because you want to keep them as cool as possible. And that's actually why, you know, we were using white plastic mulch and not black mulch is to reflect sunlight and keep the plants cool. Thanks. And then my other question was about irrigation. So do you run like drip tape for under like through the beds that you have the tunnels on? Uh, yeah, yep. Um, and so like in the earlier systems with the raised bed and the white plastic mulch, those machines lay drip tape underneath the plastic as they're laying the plastic. Um, now we're using a system of landscape fabric, which I'll show in a couple slides. Uh, and yeah, we, we lay drip tape underneath it. All right, that's it for now. Continue. Okay. okay. Uh, so yeah, so just a little bit about caterpillar tunnels. Um, they're, you know, they're kind of stripped down high tunnels to be, is kind of, I think the simplest way to describe them. They're usually 14 feet wide by 50 feet long or hundred feet long. That's usually how the kits are sold. If you buy a kit, um, they kind of function like a high tunnel and then you raise up the sides to vent them. You can have end walls with doors if you want to. There's not the same kind of amount of structural integrity. I mean, they can be put up in basically in a day, I would say, if you know what you're doing and taken down for that matter in a day. I mean, you, you know, people do like move them around their farm um, sometimes. Uh, we've done that a little bit. Uh, it's because they're not as kind of tightly constructed. You, you, you can't quite control the indoor temperature and environment quite as well as you can as a high tunnel, you know. I, I don't think people are doing, you know, uh, sensors and automatic roll up sides and fans and stuff in caterpillar tunnels. Um, so they're just kind of a simpler stripped down version of a high tunnel. You know, my maybe biggest concern with them when we got started was could they handle the wind and the storm? Uh, you know, I really didn't want to have to worry about if getting up in the morning is my tunnel still standing, you know, after you get a thunderstorm rolls through. Uh, but we've had them for three years now and I've taken plenty of major summer storms without, without really any issue. Uh, you know, just a little bit more, they have kind of the Quonset and Gothic styles. Um, you know, we have Quonset ones, basically because we, we couldn't buy the Gothic ones when we started, they weren't really available. So ours uh, can't handle snow loads. So we do kind of take the plastic off each fall. I mean, it'd be great to not have to do that. It's one extra step, but we've sort of gotten pretty good at it that it's not a huge time suck. But, um, you know, if I was buying new ones, I would certainly pay a little extra to get the Gothic and then hopefully be able to leave them um, over the winter. Although I will say one, kind of benefit of taking the plastic off is I think it's really good for soil health because, you know, we get rain and snow on them over the winter 
And I think just sort of nice to expose the soil to the sunlight and the, and the water in a more natural way. So maybe that's kind of a, a plus, I don't know. Um, you, know, you know, that kind of third bullet sort of talks about costs. And this is just based on my experience in the last couple of years. You know, we built some high tunnels and, and built caterpillar tunnels. And, you know, per kind of on a per square foot basis, um, caterpillar tunnels are about 50% less. I mean, there's, depending on different options that you choose. Uh, you can buy kits. You know, we've gotten a lot, uh, most of ours from Farmer's Friend, um, but there are other places, Tunnel Vision Hoops does it. Um, you can also um, do kind of make them yourself um, if you use a hoop bender from Johnny's. Uh, and that's definitely a viable option. The one thing I would say is we tried making some with PVC our first year as kind of a do it DIY setup. And I would not recommend that. that literally, we built the PVC tunnel. The next day, we had a storm and the PVC hoops broke. And it stood for like a day. So it doesn't seem, they just don't seem to be able to handle the high winds if you have high winds where you are. So I would recommend metal hoops um, if you're gonna do it yourself. Um, so yeah, so that's just kind of some basic, basics about caterpillar tunnels. Uh, you know, and so now kind of growing that, growing strawberries in the tunnels. So this is a picture of our first year. Uh, we kind of kept the white plastic mulch, but since we couldn't put a tractor inside this tunnel, uh, we rolled it out and kind of secured it by hand, uh, <laughs> which sort of works. Uh, plastic isn't as ni nice and tidy, um, but it, you know, it does work. But, you know, immediately, you know, by having the coverage of the tunnel, we had no leaf disease you know, no anthracnose on the berries, no soft berries after it rained. And we were basically just harvesting, you know, entirely like first quality berries. Um, we also didn't need any of the specialized equipment for making raised beds and laying plastic. You know, we never actually owned that equipment. We were always borrowing it from the university and that was never gonna be a long-term relationship. So, or, you know, solution for us. So, I mean, we would have had to buy it and I, just really didn't want to buy a piece of equipment that I use literally one time a year because um, we don't use raised beds for anything else. Um, our second year, last year, we got away from this white plastic mulch uh, and switched to uh, what you see on the left here, which is white landscape fabric. Uh, and that has been just fabulous. You know, it, there is some work on the front end. You, you burn holes in it. Uh, but once you've done that, uh, you know, you can just roll it up or leave it out each season and, and you can use it for a long time. Stuff is really sturdy. So there's no more um, throwing away a big bunch of plastic at the end of the season, which I always really disliked. Um, and, you know, you can have these kind of bigger sheets of this stuff. And so that can kind of cover your aisles. So you don't need to weed the aisles anymore. We used to just with a stir up hole weave the aisles. So it makes it really nice. And it's also just kind of softer to kneel on when you're harvesting. Uh, so, you know, just kind of a, in like an overarching view, you know, kind of being in caterpillar tunnels, they sort of solved all of the, the problems that we had, um, you know, in terms of soft berries and leaf disease. And, and, you know, we now can harvest on a schedule. So we don't watch the weather anymore. We harvest on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You know, it's a very much kind of a rhythm of the season once we get into July, harvesting three times a week. And because we're covering the aisles, we don't have to weed them or to mow them like we used to have to do when we were growing them just out in the regular field. And, you know, the yields have sort of, you know, increased dramatically. So, you know, in 2020, we were at about a half a pound of plant of strawberries. Now we're, you know, last year we were almost at one pound per plant. Uh, and so, you know, we've, you know, almost, what is that, doubled, tripled our yield um, as we moved into this system. And so, of course, you know, you have to buy these tunnels and there is an upfront cost. Um, but I would say I, you know, did some rough figuring and you, you basically pay off the tunnel in one year. So the increased yield that you get from growing 
them in the tunnel, you know, pays for the tunnel and in a year and after that, you know, it's just, it's all increased revenue. For us, the one negative of the tunnels, is it's harder to do pick your own, which is something we do a lot of. Uh, we are gonna try that this year and uh, kind of see how it goes. Uh, it's just more of a confined space. So it's just not maybe as comfortable. And like I mentioned, uh, we do take the plastic off the tunnels in the fall. And so that's just kind of extra work. Uh, we do put it back up in the spring. Uh, so all in all though, when you sort of pencil all these things out, it's, it's been a pretty, pretty big um, positive for us in, in terms of like finding a system that is feasible. And, you know, on our end, I mean, the, the customers are always super excited for the berries, but then it's a question of how do I, you know, how can I grow these berries profitable and, um, you know, with the time I have available. And so Caterpillar Tunnels have really allowed us to do that. Um, are there, there any other there questions? Was a, there was a question. What are you charging for a pint when you harvest? And then what about when you do you pick? What's the difference? Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're not really doing you pick at the moment. Um, but I guess what I would say is, so we charge by the pound. Um, I know a lot of people charge, you know, more by volume, but like pint or quart. So we charge $7 a pound um, for berries that we pick. I think that if we are doing pick your own this season, um, you know, I would guess we'd maybe be in like the $4 range or something like that for pick your own. Just kind of, I haven't done a lot of research and what other people in our area are charging for June bearing. I mean, there, there would be no one else doing pick your own day neutral strawberries uh, around us at least. So we do have a, a couple strawberry farms just down the road from us that do June bearing. And I'm not sure exactly what they're charging. I mean, we, we would, we're the only organic one. So we would charge more and probably because of that, but also just because uh, it's a different season. Um, we wouldn't charge a lot more, but maybe a little more. Thanks. And then before you switch off of this slide, the tunnels look like they're really close to one another. You know, it's like one tunnel right next to the next. Do you ever run into issues with pooling during after like large rainstorms between the tunnels where like the water cascades off of each of the tunnels there and those like middle aisle ways or the space uh, between the tunnels? No, we don't. Um, so the where we planted them. Um, is 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 a hill slightly and it's sort of like um uh verticals like this so water will flow you know out towards the ends of the tunnels basically um kind of in that area uh between the two tunnels it doesn't really cascade into the tunnels i guess if that makes sense um they are really close together they're uh two feet apart i think so they're just enough that we can walk between them to like push or pull down the plastic. Uh, but we did that because we just wanted to save space, you know, have them as close as we could together. I can see the the grade there a little bit looking down the tunnel, what you're talking right. about. Yeah. yeah. And you know, that was something that somebody had told me about. Like, so a lot of times in high tunnels, you want it to be like perfectly flat. Right, but um, caterpillar tunnels, because of the way they're constructed, you can, um, it doesn't need to be flat. And actually it's, it, it's beneficial, I think, if it's not for that very reason of just water draining away. Well, there's another question about um, planting three rows of strawberries instead of two, if you've ever tried that, but I think you might be getting into that in your next slide. So we can get back on. Yeah, I will get back on that. your schedule here. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I will. I will address that in a bit here. Um, but this actually, I, I hadn't noticed. This picture is really good at showing all the runners that these uh, plants produce. And one of the things I'll show a picture of in a little bit is how we actually have to cut all those runners. We don't have to, but we do 
And that's one difference between growing day neutrals and June bearing. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna kind of go through uh, kind of the steps we take to, to grow the, the day neutral strawberries. Uh, so we, we try to plant them as early as possible. Um, you know, middle of April is ideal for us. Uh, late April is fine too. We try to get it done though before May. Um, basically just because the sooner we get them in the ground, the sooner they get established and uh, can be ready to start producing flowers. Uh, you do have to plant by hand. Uh, I have not seen a mechanical way to plant into you know, bare root plants into landscape fabric or into plastic. So that is a pretty big undertaking, I will say. Um, you can use like a wooden, a thin wooden stick, or we use these tools we get from Norse farms, which is in the bottom picture there, this metal thing. And so the, the curved piece there, you kind of put above the, the strawberry root, and then you just push it down into the ground. Uh, it works really well. Um, we usually wrap some padding around the, the angled part where you put your hands so it just isn't so hard on your hands. Uh, the spacing we use is 12 inches uh, between plants in a row and then 12 inches between rows. So a lot of our beds are two rows per bed. Uh, so, you know, in a hundred foot um, caterpillar tunnel, there's you know, 200 plants per bed. Um, we have experimented a little bit with three rows per bed uh, with the idea of getting more plants into the tunnels. Um, and it, it, it has worked. Um, you know, we started with two rows because that's how the University of Minnesota did it. And that's kind of, you know, what we were learning. Um, but then, you know, once we had the tunnels, I started thinking about, you know, more plants, the better, you know, but not wanting to have it be too crowded so we couldn't harvest. So uh, right now we are doing four beds of two rows in our tunnels. So there's essentially eight rows of strawberries. Uh, and in one of our tunnels last year, I experimented with, you know, two beds, uh, you know, kind of alternating. So uh, two rows per bed, then three rows per bed, then two and then three. So we get 10 rows. Um, and that worked pretty well. So I would probably adopt that system if I was starting again. Uh, the problem for us is that, you know, we have a bunch of landscape fabric that we um, burned holes into at these two row bed system. And uh, we'll probably just use that stuff until it's time to recycle it and then maybe change it up. Uh, so like was asked before, um, we do have drip irrigation underneath the fabric and there's one line per row of strawberries. So, you know, if you had eight rows in a um, caterpillar tunnel, there'll be eight lines of um, drip irrigation as well. And we typically water twice per week, usually after we harvest. So often we'll water on Monday afternoon after we harvest. We don't water before we harvest because we found that Sometimes it'll make the berries a little watery and the flavor won't be quite as good. Um, so, you know, something else we do is clip runners, something like once a month, um, so that the plant focuses on fruit production because the runners, you know, are daughter plants that would establish, you know, and, and you know, bear fruit in the future, but we don't really have enough time to sort of see that cycle play out. So we're trying to get the plant to focus just on fruit production from the crown. And, you know, the, 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 the runners run, wouldn't really be able to root anyway in the fabric, but just the more energy the plant is, is putting into those runners, the less it's gonna put into uh, fruit production. So it is, you know, it is a fairly substantial job um, going through there once a month or sometimes even once, every three weeks. Um, there really isn't much weeding, which is really nice. I mean, there'll be a little bit of weeds here and there, right in the hole, right around the plants. But once they get established after about a month, they just kind of crowd out any weeds. So you don't really end up doing a lot of weeding. Uh, pinching flowers is something that there's kind of some different schools of thought about. The university will do this for a solid month, month and a half after planting. Um, the idea of like getting the plant really well established before you let it start producing fruit. 
Uh, I just haven't seen that that produces more fruit and it's just kind of a, more work, you know, to go around and, and uh, clip those flowers off. So we'll just do it maybe one time after, you know, two weeks after the plants have been planted. Uh, you know, if the plant hasn't sent up a couple nice green new leaves yet, we'll, we will cut the flower just because we figure it will kind of stunt the plant, but we don't, we don't really do much for um, pinching the flowers. Like I said before, we harvest, once we get to harvest season in July, uh, we harvest three times a week, um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, and then, you know, they end up sort of having an extra day over the weekend. So Monday is, is a really big harvest day because we're not harvesting for a couple of days over the weekend. In terms of production, um, you know, it kind of starts off slow in July and kind of you know, sort of builds week by week. They really start pumping out berries in August. That would be the biggest um, harvest time, I would say. And, and kind of into early September. And then it kind of just holds steady through September, you know, just at a lower level. And then kind of start to taper off in early August. I, at least at our farm, the plants sort of run out of steam by then. Um, so, you know, with growing in tunnels, whether they're low tunnels or caterpillar tunnels, you could really put the sides down, put the ends down, uh, up and, and really keep getting berries probably through October for the most part in Minnesota. Um, we don't do that typically. What we've decided is just that kind of once we hit early October, we get kind of the last couple of good harvests and it's just kind of not as much worth our time. We, you know, since we have to, we do actually pull all the plants out uh, and sort of amazingly, we pull them out by hand. Uh, and it surprisingly does not take that long. Actually, it doesn't take, it's amazing how fast you can walk down the row and pull them up. And we pull them up and then we sweep them to the ends of the tunnels, load them in a front end loader on the tractor and then compost them. Uh, but we'd like to do that before it's super cold out in November. And so it's a nice job in October. And so we just kind of end harvest in early October and and then kind of get ready for winter and um, get the plants taken out and the, the plastic taken off the top of the tunnels. Uh, so just a kind of a couple, you know, what's things that you, you might be challenging, things to kind of watch out for. So heat is a big one. Uh, you know, day neutrals won't produce flowers when the temp is over 90 degrees for multiple days. So that's what the literature says and, you know, what, researchers will tell you. I actually really haven't observed that at our farm, but what I have observed is that when nighttime temperatures don't get below 70 degrees for a couple of days, it seems like they do stop flowering. And we haven't had that problem at all up until last year. Last year in June, it was really hot in Southern Minnesota. And so there was a week or so when the nighttime temperatures do not get below 70 and they did stop flowering. Um, and so we, we didn't start our harvest season as early. We didn't start to like mid July cause we, the flowering was kind of delayed. Uh, we ended up having our best year ever um, anyways. And so, I mean, I think we definitely lost some yield but it, it seems like um, as long as the nighttime temperatures you know, don't stay hot for a long time, they, they will keep flowering. So at least that's what we've seen. Um, you know, we keep it as cool as we can in our tunnels. We leave the ends off, the sides are up as far as they go, you know. And this year, I think I'm gonna experiment um, with, uh, oh, I'm forgetting what it's called. It's like this uh, shade cloth. So trying to put some shade cloth on top of one of our caterpillar tunnels just to see if that would cool it down even a little more. That's just like, if, if we really needed that, would that be a strategy to keep it cooler in the tunnels? Um, in terms of pests, uh, tarnished plant bug is kind of the main challenge that we have. Um, you know, it, it kind of creates these hard-ended berries like you see in that picture. Uh, we will, usually spray once or twice with uh, Hyganic, which is a 
organic approved insecticide and we add vinegar to it. Uh, it's just something a, another farmer told me about. I, I think what it does is lower the pH of the water and organic is more effective with a lower pH. Uh, spotted wing Drosophila is, you know, as a berry grower is something that's kind of a major issue in a lot of ways in Minnesota. Uh, I've been really surprised though that we do not get much pressure in the tunnels. And I think it has something to do with the environment in there. They just, they don't seem to go into the tunnels. Like we'll have um, blueberries and stuff and we have a lot of spotted wing pressure and then we'll be harvesting strawberries and they seem to be just fine. And they're, you know, a couple hundred feet away. Uh, I don't, I've never studied that. I've never read that in any study. So I, I can't, maybe it's just a, Kind of a quirk of our site they don't like it as much there i don't really know but it hasn't been been much of an issue for us um varieties so the two starred varieties albion and monterey are ones that i would recommend that have done good for us uh, and they you know I, I sort of wrote the same thing about both of them you know they have good yields the flavor is great and the, Berry size is really good. Uh, Albion tends to be have a little higher yields in the sort of second half of the season. Monterey seems to have higher yields earlier in the season, so they make a nice um, match in that way. Uh, Seascape is another one that's definitely worth trying if you're going to grow Danish with strawberries. Uh, the flavor is out of this world. Uh, in California, they sell strawberries as like seascape, like they label that variety because it's so good. Uh, there is a mixture of like sort of large and small, which is not necessarily all that bad. Um, sometimes it's kind of nice, small berries can really pack a nice flavor. Uh, the one challenge that we have had with it is that in general, it's a softer berry. And so it, it gets overripe easily and quicker than other varieties. And, when it's really hot in July or August and the plants are really producing a lot of berries, um, I feel like you almost need to harvest seascape every day to kind of keep the quality up. Uh, so that's kind of a challenge. Uh, we do grow a little bit of seascape just because the flavor is so good uh, that I just can't kind of part with growing it. Uh, Portola is a very popular variety. It's um, one of the varieties that's often, you know, maybe what you're buying in a store if you're buying strawberries from California. Uh, I think the flavor is really mediocre. I, it just doesn't excite me. Uh, it also has a lot of problems with leaf disease. So if you're not growing them in some kind of protected uh, structure, I really wouldn't, I wouldn't plant Portola. I think with the humidity and rain that we get in the Midwest, it's just not a good, match. I will say it has a really high yield. It's probably the highest yield of any of these varieties. Um, but I would say that I don't think your customers will love the flavor as much as some of the other varieties. Uh, one of the varieties is San Andreas. Uh, it's really large. It's the largest, kind of produces the largest berry of all of these ones I've listed. Uh, one challenge is it has a little more of an orange color, and so it can be hard to tell when it's ripe. Uh, I know another grower who's had really good yields with San Andreas. It's been kind of variable for us, uh, sometimes good, sometimes low. Uh, so we, we, we stopped growing it, uh, but it, you know, it's an option. One other one that's out there is Cabrillo. Uh, we've grown it a little bit, um, just been, kind of been okay. So it just, we haven't, haven't kind of kept growing it. Uh, and that's it. Um, that's all I've got. I'd be happy to answer any, any questions I can. Um, yeah. Aaron, I might've missed it. On that last slide, you had a couple of varieties with an asterisk next to it. Are those, what, what does that signify? Oh, uh, those are the ones I, I would recommend planting. Uh, okay. those, are, those are the two that have done the best for us. Um, Seascape also is, is worth checking out, but Albion and Monterey, I think are the best that we've found. Great. 
All right. Well, um, we did have another question in the chat. Um, can you cut and save your runners to use for the following year or for another time? Yeah, I think you totally could. Um, I'm just thinking about uh, how you would store them. Uh, if you could store them in a cooler, what kind of temperature? Um, or if you would plant them, you know, cut them and plant them and, you know, pots, but then how would you keep them going over the winter? I guess maybe if you have a greenhouse. Uh, I, don't, I don't know a lot about how that's done, uh, but I, th I think it certainly could be an option. And then I was curious, you described, you know, part of your process at the end of the season is to pull out all of that year's plants. Do you do that so that you can pull the the plastic up? Like, do you have to get those out of the way first before you can pull the plastic up? Or why do you pull the plants out instead of just letting them compost right there in that same location? Uh, okay, so we, we pull them out because we don't want some of them to survive. So like, they're not winter hardy, but you know, they could somewhat survive. And so we're pulling them out to like essentially flip the field, to either plant a cover crop or to put down compost, you know, sort of like take, take the next sort of step of field management. So yeah, we um, have kind of a way that we like roll the landscape fabric back. So we don't entirely take it out of the tunnel, but then we apply compost um, and you know sort of are ready I guess we could till it you know we could kind of do whatever uh but yeah it's sort of so we can take the kind of next step in the field we've got a question in the chat we are in warmer zone 5a is heat likely more of a problem yeah well you know I know the I I know the zones are are actually really based on like minimum temperature in winter. So, you know, our zone, we, we've been having this longer growing season uh, lately and, but yet our cold temperature, we still get negative 30 every winter. And so that's always kind of a limiter for us. And so I imagine though that you still are, you know, a handful of degrees warmer than us in the summer, you know, maybe more commonly, you know, 90 degrees is pretty common. Uh, so I guess I don't know, you know, I would think about what the, like I said, what I've seen is these nighttime temperatures, the plants will be fine with the heat. It's, it's not that they're not going to do well. It's just more, will they flower? And if, you know, if they're not flowering, they're not going to produce any fruit for you. And it's not like it's going to be the whole season that they won't flower. It's just that would, would you know, would you lose, um, a week or two or, or that sort of thing. And, and that's just a question I don't know because I don't know how hot it is there, you know, in the nights or or in the days, if that is one of the limiters. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. I think that's a good answer. And the other thing is like, you know, the seasons are becoming more variable too. And so how do you like factor that into these equations? <laughs> right, and you know, if you can plant earlier, uh, you might start getting, you know, berries earlier and, and then later in the fall. And even if you have decreased production a little bit in the summer, like they just kind of hold out until it gets a little cooler, you know, you might still have a pretty good crop. Can you talk a little bit more about your rotation? So you mentioned that you might, you know, plant one bed down with, you know, cover crops or compost. Can you describe a little bit more about how you move or rotate things across the property? Uh, yeah, so I would say honestly, that is the, a work in progress. Um, because we've changed systems each year, we've kind of changed where we've been growing. And now we've kind of settled on this system. And so now it's like figuring out what's the like long-term strategy for doing that. Uh, so uh, my best answer is I, I don't have a good answer. My, my sort of plan is to uh, 
probably, you know, apply compost at the end of the season and, and hopefully come up with a system where we could rotate another crop in the tunnel so that we could, you know, grow something else uh, the second year and then come back to strawberries. Or, you know, maybe it will take a fallow year where we just, not a true fallow year, but like where we would just grow a cover crop. I mean, part of the challenge is that there's just not much growing season left. And once we get to the 1st of October, I mean, we could plant winter rye and get a little bit of growth, um, but not a ton, not a lot to build organic matter. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's kind of a to be determined, I guess. Uh, one other thing I've, I've certainly thought about as well, we could end the season even a little bit earlier to try to plant a cover crop and get more growth. Um, I guess just to answer the question about like, what does the soil feel like? Um, I would actually say it feels really good. Uh, strawberries, which is not as big of a plant. And although I'm sure they're taking a lot of, a lot out of the cell to produce that, um, that fruit, they're, you know, they're not these like massive straw, like tomato plants or something that you're growing in a high tunnel since they're so close to the ground. So they, they don't seem to be as like heavy of a feeder, maybe. That's just like my sort of initial um, thought at the moment. So we've got somebody that wants to try out day neutral strawberries in their garden. It's the first time they're gonna be growing strawberries. Um, they're in zone five and they're wondering about, you know, where to find good plants. Sure. Um, so uh, Indiana Berry Company is, would be an option. Uh, Norse Farms is another one. Uh, they're out of Massachusetts. I mean, those places, I mean, that's kind of the type of place that we would buy from. And I'm just trying to think if they sell smaller quantities, you know, like a lot of times they sell the, you know, plants in bundles of like 25. And so I, I guess it maybe depends on if your garden would be that big, that that would make sense for you. Um, but those would be two that come to mind, Indiana Berry Company, Norse Farms, uh, Norris is N-O-U-R-S-E. All right, and before like we, I wanna, you know, open still, if you have more questions, um, pop them in the chat, but I'm also curious, um, chime in or like, you know, like say me, if you grow strawberries currently, like do you have, like anybody in the audience, like let us know, are you a current strawberry producer? I'm curious how many people are already growing strawberries on their operations. Carl says he tried strawberries in his garden one year and the bir birds consumed a lot of the crop. Any thoughts on bird control? Uh, well, we have a lot of birds that go after blueberries at our farm. And I think that they're just more interested in the blueberries than they are in the strawberries in our case. Uh, we use, um, it's a sound system. It's like these speakers that um, send out like birds of prey noises uh, that, or they're like distress calls of birds that eat berries. Uh, it's, it's a little, you wouldn't want to do it at your house, uh, you know, around your garden. It's, it's sort of annoying. Uh, we actually turn it off when customers are at the farm, uh, but it does sort of keep the birds away. Uh, they don't get uh, desensitized I, to it as the season goes on. I mean, they do. They definitely do. I mean, it's like random and it, you know, it sort of tries to like keep it from being a pattern, but you know, over time they figure it out, but it just keeps them from entirely taking over. Yep. All right. Well, do we have any other questions from folks? Oh, there was, there was a question really early on. Somebody was curious if you work with Becca from Seeds Farm, uh, Seeds Farm. Pepper. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, just down the road from me. Yeah, I know Becca really well.
so Carl, Carl, following up on the bird question, we should, so we should plant a sacrificial crop for the birds. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, that is, you know, sort of, a, I think, a, an interesting idea of like, you know, what's more interesting to the birds than the strawberries that you're just fine with letting them have. And there's probably some kind of normal landscaping plant or something you get at a nursery that the birds would flock to and then leave your, your good stuff alone. Well, and Carl, I think, aren't you in a, like, I know you're in Pennsylvania, but I was thinking for some reason that maybe you do like some rooftop gardening or like urban gardening. So I wonder if netting, I, I mean, if you have a small enough um, plot that some netting would be adequate and not too difficult to deal with. Yeah, sunflowers, yeah. yeah. All right, well, with no other questions, we will break away for the evening. Aaron, thanks so much for your time and sharing your experience with these different strategies of as you've been figuring out what your, you know, what works on your farm. Um, I'm gonna send out a thank you email to everybody tomorrow with Aaron's email and a link to his farm website. And there will be a link to the Farm and Art Archive. So if you do wanna revisit this recording, um, just keep your, we usually get the recording posted like a day afterwards. So by the end of day tomorrow, this should be posted. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate your time, Aaron. Thank you yeah. so much. And thank you everybody for tuning in tonight. Good night, folks. <laughs>